Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the First Baptist Church of Philadelphia. My name is Pastor James. I am delighted that you could join with us this morning as we explore the comfort offered by our Lord Jesus Christ and hopefully experience God in some new and transformative ways this morning as well. But before we venture into our topic, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning. And we'll do so by singing together across all these distances, our first hymn. Our next hymn is What a Fellowship, What a Joy Divine. We will be doing uh, all three verses. together in prayer. Gracious God, we ask that you be with us this morning. We ask that you make your presence known to us and that we feel your spirit, Lord. Help us to feel united across this, um, this spatial distancing, Lord, and help us to remember that we're part of this community, the community of faithful believers, not only here in our own congregation, but as members of your body across the globe. And we're so grateful, Lord, that we can draw on so many for strength, for guidance, for wisdom, for comfort. Lord, we ask that you be with us this morning and that we experience you in new and transformative ways, that you come upon us with greatness, Lord, with goodness, with your majesty, and that you continue to shape us into who you wish for us to become. We thank you, Lord, for being with us today as you are every day. And may this worship be worthy to you, our God. In your name we do pray. Amen. Why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? When 
Thank you, Lydell, for that moving piece and for reminding us that he who watches over and cares for even the sparrow is the same who watches and cares for us, his beloved. Now, you may be asking yourself, James, were you wearing a different shirt a moment ago? I was, and as Lydell was singing this beautiful song, I spilled communion wine all over me, and so now I have on 
I think it's a Laotian barong, which was the only shirt in my office. So uh, I, I'm delighted that I get to do costume changes with all of you. And I did want to say I've been reading the comments as they come in and seeing some of you. So Johanna, Andy, Elizabeth, Frank, Beryl, and Horace, Arlene, Virgia, Julie, John, uh, and, and Dale, Mary Ann, uh, Jerry, aka Mom, uh, Victoria, and Kathy. It is great to see all of you. And I'm so sorry if I missed anyone. Uh, but I was delighted to see your names pop up on my screen. Thank you for being here and joining us together today as we explore God and the comfort that he, he gives us. So as always, we do have a few announcements for today, but I will try to keep it brief. Most of you know what's coming. If you do have any prayer requests, please send them to us. We love praying for you and we want to pray for you. This is a big part of what we do and a big part of our own faith. So please send your requests to us. We look forward to serving you. Uh, we have Bible study on Wednesday nights at six through Facebook Live. And I hope that you'll join us as we continue to explore what's known as Paul's Epistle of Joy, the letter to the Philippians. If you missed last week's study, that's okay. They're being posted to our YouTube page pretty regularly, so you can always go there to venture and see what you've missed. We look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Now, this next Saturday, we are once again going out and feeding the homeless. If you'd like to join us, please feel free to do so. We'd love to have you. I do have to say that we are social distancing and you will have to wear a mask. It will probably give you some gloves and we'll want to be very aware and be safe, but the need is there and we need to, to continue to venture out into the city and, and feed these hordes of homeless that God has put in our community. So if you'd like to join us, come to Logan Square at 10 a.m. We're right by the cafe there in front of the church uh, and, and we'd love to have you. Typically, we feed from 400 to 450 meals and the extra hands are always appreciated. And of course, if you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can do so by going to our webpage and uh, getting or clicking the donation tab. Just make sure that you are earmarking the donation for the homeless ministry. And if you have any, any donations, any food stuffs or clothing stuff, socks, we're always looking for socks or shoes. If you have any, send us an email and we can arrange a pickup or a drop off. If you know of anyone who would benefit, you think, from receiving a DVD copy of our services, please let us know. Send us an email to office at First Baptist Church, uh, sorry, office at firstbaptistphiladelphia.org, and we will make sure that those go out. And as always, please make sure that you are following us on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, now on YouTube, um, so that you can keep up with all that's going on in the First Baptist community. Now I'm done. Oh, and it looks like I missed a name. Kathy, how could I forget you? It's good to see you this morning, Kathy. Uh, this week, we are pleased to welcome as our guest soloists, Kyle Walker and his wife, Catherine Dennis. The eclectic landscape of the chamber music repertoire forms the ideal musical playground for Jamaican artist a Jamaican-American violinist, Catherine Dennis. Already in her young career, she has performed in venues across Europe, the United States, and Canada, including Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, and Meriwether Post Pavilion. Additionally, she has performed at a bevy of international music festivals. Catherine has immersed herself in the world of new music. She has premiered pieces for many living composers. Venturing beyond the classical universe, Catherine collaborates frequently with musicians within the pop and jazz worlds. Recent performances have included shows with her and Jonathan DuBose. Miss Dennis has not only distinguished herself as a performer, but also as an educator. She has facilitated multiple workshops at Carnegie Hall and upstate New York. And during her undergraduate career, she received two years of intensive Suzuki teacher training and maintained her registration for all 10 Suzuki books. She has established and continues to cultivate music programs within the New York City metropolitan area and is on faculty at multiple music conservatories within New York City. Catherine holds a bachelor's degree from the Fletcher School of Music at East Carolina v University, where she studied with Era Gregorian and a master's from McGill University's Schulich School of Music under the tutelage of Axel Strauss. She completed her Hunter College's Lincoln Center Scholar Alternative Certification Program, where she earned a second master's in music education. Thank you for being with us today, Catherine. We look forward to hearing uh, you play. And many of you already know Catherine's husband, Kyle, who is a frequent guest at First Baptist Church. 
Kyle is also a strong advocate for social equality, uh, and he believes music can speak to social issues better than verbal language can. The understanding of which he brings to both traditional Western repertoire and that of the living worldwide composers with whom he collaborates. Highlights of this season include appearances at the Color of Music Festival, a solo recital tour throughout the East and West Coasts, and a Lincoln Center appearance alongside Miss America 2019. Mr. Walker has been featured on WNYC, WQXR, NPR, and UNC-TV. Recent performances include his debut solo recital at Vial Hall at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, Stern Auditorium at Carnegie Hall, the Great Hall at Cooper Union, the Tantaluna Cave of Australia, and the Lyde Center of Kansas. As an advocate of social justice, Kyle is a founding member and pianist of the Dream Unfinished, an activist orchestra which supports New York City-based civil rights and community organizations through concerts and presentations. Kyle performs with the group Sanctuary Project New York City. The ensemble, composed of classically trained musicians and dancers, creates original productions through a collaborative rehearsal process centered around structured improvisation. Kyle is currently touring a solo performance project entitled Bach to Black Notes, which features the music of Johann Sebastian Bach juxtaposed with music of neglected composers who speak to issue as issues of oppression and inequality. Kyle and Catherine, thank you for blessing us with your amazing gifts this morning.
I think um, Rotang, you said it best. Uh, beautiful, sublime, um, and and Renee, you as well. Beautiful. Yeah. Let's join together in prayer. Oh God, we join together this morning. First of all, thanking you for all that you do in our lives and the miraculousness of your creation, Lord. When the weather is as it is, I can't help but look out and see your hand in our creation. And be perplexed and blown away, amazed by its beauty. There's so much to be thankful, Lord, for. So often, I forget about these things. We forget about these things as we encounter the struggles, the challenges, the troubles of our life. And we let them get in the way and distract us. But I feel reminded again and again this morning about your great love for us. Not only for your creation, which we, we saw that you cared for, Lord. Looking at the sparrow. Clothing the flowers of the field as you do, Lord. And as you say how much more you care for us. And I wonder why even worry? Why even worry, Lord, when we have you to lean into? When we have you to guide us, to navigate us? But despite the wondering, of course we do still worry. And we come into your open arms again and again and again. And for that, oh God, we are thankful. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are going through trouble this morning, Lord. Who are suffering sickness. Who are suffering injustice. Who are suffering inequality. Who are suffering at the hands of peoples and diseases. Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you be with them. We pray for magnificent healing. We pray for your justice in the world. We pray, Lord, that your hand be upon them and that your presence be made known to them, that they not fear, that they not be troubled, but that they remember in whose hands they lie. We pray these things, Lord, and we know you hear them. And you hear that which is unsaid as well. But we come together as a community today, Lord, with like hearts, like minds, asking for your presence in this world, that it be made known, and that we be aware of it, because surely it's here. May we be in tune with your movings, and may we have eyes to see your miraculous hand in the world around us. May you hear all of our concerns and needs in this prayer that we pray together, as well as though, Lord, our adoration, our praise, our reverence for you, our God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, this is the time in our service where we go to our time of giving. For those of you who have already given, thank you so much. We really do appreciate your support. And for those of you who would like to, please go to 
firstbaptistphiladelphia.org and hit the giving tab and we will get you set up. And of course, please feel free to mail in your tithes and offerings as well. Now, let us pray for these gifts which have been given as well as those which are forthcoming. Gracious God, we thank you for entrusting us with these resources, Lord. We ask they be used for your glory and that your love spread across Philadelphia and beyond through it, Lord. Help us to be excellent stewards of that which you give us. And help us not to do anything out of our own selfish ambitions or vain conceit, but do everything in your name for your glory, God. And in love, we dedicate these offerings. In your name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is Days Are Filled with Sorrow and Care. We will be singing all three verses. pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning yet again to all of you. As I was preparing for worship throughout this week, it occurred to me what a blessing it is that we are exploring comfort today and the comfort that we find in Jesus Christ. Because frankly, like so many of you, I need comfort right now. Comfort from a virus unlike any that you or I have ever seen. Comfort as we live life in odd isolation. 
comfort as we navigate widespread unemployment and economic downturn, comfort as we face a di divisive country, comfort as we fight for equality for all peoples, comfort from the terrible happenings that we see and hear about so often and aided by the now instantaneous nature of communication. In the midst of all this, it's not unfair to say, I need comfort, God. Fortunately, for you and I, we have a God who cares. And earlier we heard Lydell sing, His Eye is on the Sparrow, which is reflecting, as I said earlier, on the words of uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they, are you not much more valuable than they? Indeed, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? God cares. And because God cares, God comforts. We know this to be true. Throughout the entire biblical corpus, this is the case. In the Old Testament, we encounter a God who proclaims to his faithful, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And who in the New Testament declares, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. In our own time and place in history, we are certainly not unique in our own need for comfort. And this morning, I felt called to reflect on the passing yet comforting words of Paul that he delivers in his second letter to the believers in Corinth. It goes like this. We'll read it together. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. We find in our scripture that comfort has always been something sought out by the Christian. Indeed, something needed by those who chose to follow God. Indeed, experience has told me that any notion of a life void of needing comfort is thrown out the window the moment we proclaim Jesus is Lord of our life. And in this passage, the one that we just read, we find ourselves at the very beginning of yet another letter of Paul's to the troubled and often troublesome church in Corinth. Corinth, as you see here, is situated on the isthmus between the Greek mainland and the Peloponnese in the south. And it was often easier for traders to sail to Corinth and transport their goods over land to the other side instead of trying their luck at sailing around the turbulent waters of southern Greece. Did I have another picture? Anyway, you, you see it there. So, so Corinth became this incredible trade town. And as is a hallmark of the most famed shipping ports, Corinth became synonymous with great cultural diversity and wealth, as well as paganism and a worldwide infamy, actually, for debauchery, as was highlighted by the, president, or by the presence of, the, of Aphrodite's famous temple and her 1,000 temple prostitutes that were said to live there. So given the diversity in the cultural, societal, and moral expectations present in Corinth, 
It's no wonder that Paul was ceaselessly writing to this challenged church who was working in an even more challenging mission field. This was a tough place to have a church. This was a tough place to survive even. There was a rough crowd. It was busy. It was wealthy. There was all kinds of trade going on. All kinds of people from around the world with all kinds of ideologies, desires, needs. Here in this letter, Paul is right away addressing this trouble and offering comfort. Simple as that. I think that's really what it is. Paul is, he starts off his letter and then we get to these lines and he's offering comfort. But as is true with all of the Pauline letters, what may have seemed like passing words to Paul are pregnant with divine insight to the faithful reader, even some 2,000 years later. Paul talks about trouble. This is appropriate because Paul was a man who knew trouble. Indeed, Paul, who too often found himself leaving cities in the dark of night while stowed away inside of baskets, being lowered through holes in city gates, all to evade the many enemies who sought to kill him. Paul, who had already been stoned by surging crowds until he was thought to be dead, only for him to regain consciousness and re-walk back into that same city. Paul, who had been flogged and imprisoned and beat more times than I can count on both my hands and my feet. This is the Paul who's writing, the Paul who knew trouble. And he was writing to those in trouble. The word that Paul uses in this passage is thlipsis. There you go. Everyone say thlipsis. Very good. Thlipsis is the word that our English Bible translates as trouble or affliction in the NRSV. As is so often the case, there's more nuance to this word than our translations can convey. Trouble. Affliction. These are the words that you come across in our English pages. But they don't carry the weight of the original thlipsis. New Testament scholars are quick to remind us that thlipsis conveys a physical pressing. Okay? Um, Famed Anglican Archbishop R.C. Trench says that in the ancient laws of England, the punishment for those who refused to plead to a crime was to lay them on their back and have these massive weights or stones placed on their chest until they they either pled or were crushed to death. I think of um, Samuel Beckett's and I can't remember the name of the, uh, the Salem Witch Trial play. They, they have the, the same thing, uh, stones on the chest, until either a plea comes out or death comes rushing. This is the literal embodiment of thlipsis, of a pressing. And Paul says that this, this thlipsis, is the kind of trouble that you will face. Trouble of a pressing nature. Trouble that moves you to cry out in earnestness, in a plea. And Paul knew this because Paul knew trouble all too well. And Paul knew the kind of trouble that these believers were facing now and the kind of trouble that awaited for them in just a few years' time when persecutions would really ramp up. Paul knew the immense pressures that loom for any Christians back then or even today. Last week we talked very briefly about collectivist versus individualistic cultures, and we do well to remember that the culture of the early church, and indeed the reality for most Christians past and present, is not an individualistic one. We are unique in that way. And of course, there are pluses and minuses to being part of either culture. In Paul's days, for instance, to accept Christ would have had to have been a family affair in order for it to be quote-unquote kosher. Uh, As we see in the examples of the centurions and their households, on several occasions in Scripture, religion was held by an entire household. If you weren't the head of a household, your religious beliefs 
were not up to you. The household took the belief of the head of the household. That's how it was. That's how it still is today in many places. The person who proclaims, Curios, Usos, Christos, Jesus is Lord, simultaneously declares wholehearted allegiance to only that one person, Jesus Christ. And at this place, in this time, that meant for many the permanent banishment from the family. That meant saying goodbye to whatever career or job you had likely had been passed down through your family line for centuries. That meant saying goodbye to your housing. That meant saying goodbye to your support system. That meant saying goodbye to the only people you really knew and loved in this world. And it meant all this to further enter into a world of persecution and oppression. To enter in a world where the Christian would gain the disdain of not only their heathen neighbors, not only your religious and familial communities, but even of the official powers. William Barclay so eloquently reminds us, it is always a costly thing to be a real Christian. For there can be no Christianity without its cross. And I humbly add on that there can be no Christianity without flipsis, without feeling the immense pressure of the world. For Paul, the answer to our suffering always lies, at least in part, in endurance. And he talks about this a lot, I think. We've talked about this a lot. Paul talks about racers finishing the race and beating their breasts and pushing through the pain to get all the way to the end, keeping in mind that goal at the end. For Paul, this all lies in hupamane. Go ahead, say hupamane. Hupamane. There, we can all say it together. Uh, the keynote of this is not grim or bleak acceptance, but one of triumph. When I look at this Greek word, I think of the English word hope, which you can almost see in there, although I don't believe there's an entomological linking, because indeed the calling card of the early Christian and those present is a tremendous hope in the future, right? Hope in the promises of God. Hope that our efforts aren't in vain. Hope that we put our faith in something that's real, in something that's tangible. Hope that we will see our loved ones again. Hope that we will not die but have eternal life. And hope that our present sufferings, whatever they may be, how difficult they may be, will be vanquished by our God. And hope that as the silver comes purer from the fire, so the Christian can emerge finer and stronger from the troubled days, from the flipsis. In all of our struggles, we are able to square off with our most aggressive challengers time and time and time again because of our hypomone, our steadfastness, our patience, our endurance. And fortunately, friends, we are not alone to face this trial. We are not alone to maintain our steadfastness. Indeed, I don't think it'd be possible to do so. Who could do so in the face of the persecution of these early Christians? This passage that we read which in full mentions comfort, uh, par paraclesis, uh, no less than nine times. And it reminds us that through all of our challenges, we can expect to encounter the comfort of God. And this is not comfort in any normal sense, but rather a comfort of divine origins, a comfort of divine strength. Scholars are quick to point out that comfort in the New Testament, always means more than just a soothing sympathy as we hold it. The Latin root of the English word comfort is fortis, uh, com fortis, which means brave. 
Christian comfort is the comfort which brings with it bravery and courage. It's the kind of comfort that allows you to cope with all that life is throwing your way. It's the kind which assures you that God is with you in the task at hand. It's the comfort that finds a sort of inspiration in our own suffering. The kind that allows us to look at our predicament and persevere beyond any semblance of reasonableness. I'm aware that I sound a bit vague and ambiguous. Let me illustrate this through a real-life example. If you look at this picture here, uh, this is a cohort from Myanmar visiting at International Ministries. Uh, and you see me on the left. The, the gentleman next to me, the shorter of the gentleman, is a man named Langjaw Gam Sang. Gam Sang is a pastor in the Kachin state of Myanmar. This is the northernmost part of Myanmar. He made international news after being released from 15 months of captivity under the Myanmar military. Game Sang was tortured and jailed by Myanmar officials once in 2012 and again on Christmas Eve in 2016 along with Dumdaw Nang Lat, a church deacon. During his 15 months in prison, Gam's hands never once went from being untied from behind his back and he repeatedly passed in and out of consciousness for several weeks. At one point, he was shackled for over a month with his eyes tightly sealed and with no blanket to keep him warm while suffering the immense cold of Myanmar's most northern border inside of a stone dungeon. At certain parts of his, points of his captivity, Gam Sang begged to die. When Pastor Gam Sang visited uh, with International Ministries uh, two August ago now, August of 2019, it was at the express behest of Reverend Hklalem Sampson. He's actually standing next to Gam in the picture, so two away from me. At both of whom fully expected to be immediately thrown in a Burmese prison once they returned home from their advocacy tour. Uh, and this isn't r really the platform to talk about all that's going on in Myanmar and has been going on, but basically these ethnic groups uh, are facing... I don't think it's too strong of a word to say a type of genocide at the hands of several powers. Um, and Gam Sang and Colum Sampson fully expected that on their return to Myanmar, they would be yet again thrown into prison, tortured, and killed. And when asked how they could endure such, such suffering, their attestation was always this by the comfort of God. The comfort of God, regardless of how ambiguous that might sound, is a real and remarkable thing. And it's accessible to you in all that you do. We've been talking a lot about community, and both the ideas of suffering and of comfort happen within this context. In fact, we talk about how we do well to look at our faith through the lens of community because God calls us to the sacred community. As Paul puts it, our own suffering is the overflow of Christ's suffering reaching to us. It's a sharing in the suffering of Christ. When you are suffering, it's not you alone. For does not Christ join you in your pain? Does not Christ join you in your sorrow? Does not Christ join you in your suffering? No, suffering is an act of community. And if, su if Christ is suffering, then the body of Christ is suffering. So when we read Psalms that don't seem to fit into our own situation. May we remember that we're not just praying for ourselves, but for the whole suffering body of Christ. And when we at night go to our prayers, may we not forget this global community that we are immersed in. When we pray, we pray for those who are suffering, not just ourselves, not just those we know, but Christians all around the globe who are certainly part of this body of Christ, this one united community. And when we suffer, we do it with the hope 
that is either for our own good, you know, God forming and reshaping us through the suffering into a more capable Christian, or for the good of others, our community, who very well may see our suffering and see Christ in it, as we do what the likes of Pastor Gem sang, Reverend Clown Sampson, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and all the saints and martyrs in our centuries of traditions. In the old days of chivalry, the knights used to come demanding some specially difficult task in order that they might show their devotion to the lady whom they loved. So, too, do we take up this challenge and with a fervor. For to suffer for Christ is a privilege. And when the hard thing comes, as it surely will, the Christian can say, as Polycarp, the aged bishop of Smyrna, said when they bound him to his stake before setting it ablaze, I thank you, Lord, that you have judged me worthy of this honor. Beyond this, it's in the context of our holy community that we have the ability, and I dare even say, the power to comfort others. Paul claims several times that the things which have happened to him, along with the comfort which he has received, are what made him able to be a source of comfort to others. It is those who have lost a loved one to cancer that can most ably comfort those going through the same thing. It is the tortured who can prepare us for our torturing, the depressed who can prepare us for depression. In your own suffering, in your own uncomfortableness, remember that you carry with you a message of hope to others, a message that says you will get through this. And as a brother and sister in the body of Christ, we say, we will get through this. For if I can do it, so can you. We have the same sustainer. We're held by the same God. Where we read of Jesus in the book of Hebrews, he says in the second chapter of Hebrews, because he himself has gone through it, he is able to help others go through it. So it is with us, brothers and sisters. May we always remember in the midst of suffering and in the midst of the suffering of the many who came before us, having been pressed, having gone through suffering and having emerged triumphant, if only by the hand of God. And may we share in our suffering with the whole community, the whole body of Christ, that we may strengthen one another, alleviating each other's burdens, and bringing, bearing a semblance of comfort. And above all, may we remember the one who sustains us, who never lets us fall and whose comfort cannot be matched. Let us pray. Oh God, we come together in our suffering to you, Lord. We come to our sufferings in hope. Hope that It's a suffering ordained by you for our growth, or it's a suffering ordained by you for the growth of others. And in the midst of our suffering, Lord, we ask that we can adopt, remember to adopt the mindset that it is for your glory, whether past glory, present glory, or future, that it is all for you and for our sacred community that in our suffering we may encourage others. Lord, help us to be a comfort to those in and outside of our communities. 
that your love shine through us, that your care come through us, and that we look at every individual around the globe with your eyes, that we see in them a child of God, and that we offer them that divine comfort that we learn from, from you, that we inherit from our own church communities, and that we pass on with your strength, with your consent, with your delight. Give us the courage, Lord, to face that which we are meant to face. And through it, may we meet comfort, divine comfort, and share that comfort with others. In your holy name we do pray. Amen. Our next hymn is Just When I Need Him, Jesus is Near. We will be doing verses 1, 2, and 4. Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. Ready to help me, ready to cheer. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need him most, just when I need him, Jesus is true, never forsaking all the way through. Giving for burdens, pleasures are new, just when I need Him most. Just when I need Him most, just when I need Him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need Just when I need him, he is my all. Answering when upon him I call. Tenderly watching, lest I should fall. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him time in our service where we join together in holy communion. Importantly, we believe that this table is not our table, not the table of the First Baptist Church of Philadelphia or even of James Williams. Rather, this is Christ's table, a table of wholeness and a table of wellness. And all are invited to participate with us this morning in this most sacred act of remembrance. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread and gave thanks. Let us give thanks. God, the God who clothes us, the God who feeds us, the God who gives us our daily bread. May we never lose sight of all that you give us and how you sustain us, Lord. And in times of trouble, the divine comfort that you give us. We are blessed to have all these things in your name. Amen. 
and he took the bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Take it and eat. And in like manner, Jesus took the cup, and again he gave thanks. Oh God, we give you thanks yet again for all that you do in our lives, for using us, for allowing us to be a part of your purpose, for allowing us to share your love and light to Philadelphia and beyond, for allowing us to be a part of this great and holy global body of yours. Thank you for our brothers and sisters near and far, and for immersing us in this holy community. In your name we do pray. Amen. And Jesus said, This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, shed for many. Drink ye all of it. And now, brothers and sisters, may the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now in this life and in the glorious life to come. And may the comfort of God, which transcends all obstacles and barriers, be with you now and forevermore. Stay safe, stay well, and stay blessed. I love you all. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care. Thank you.